We, we trying to prevent it, but it's up to the youth to not, you know, come on now, why you gonna waste your life? A message from a gun violence survivor. To put down the weapons. Cincinnati's latest approach to reducing gun violence while addressing the mental health impact on children. From WLWT, this is Let's Talk Cincy, presented by Western and Southern Financial Group. Put our financial strength behind you. The numbers are staggering. The ripple effects are startling. The solution seems to be elusive. Welcome to Let's Talk Cincy. I'm Stephen Albert. At a meeting, Cincinnati city officials said there were more than 400 shootings in 2022. Police, doctors, and city leaders came together to figure out ways to bring those numbers down. WLWT's Rachel Hersheimer has our story. It's an issue impacting this city almost every day, year after year. You don't want to be that sister or that mother that's going to get that call for that your son has been shot. A city database shows at least 29 reported shootings in Cincinnati so far this year, and that number is likely higher. One of the things that has been problematic for us that we didn't used to see uh, are disputes that originate through social media. Just last year, Lieutenant Colonel Michael John with CPD says two people died over a parking space. His department is looking into why disputes like this sometimes end in gun violence. I think it's a combination. Um, COVID definitely impacting uh, communities in ways that we really didn't imagine could happen. Uh, be, people being put out of work. Inside UC Medical Center and Cincinnati Children's, doctors on the front line say treating these victims is becoming the new normal. In 2020 alone, to echo some of the previous data, we saw over 500 victims of gun violence at our institution alone. Since 2020, firearm-related injury is the leading cause of death for children in the United States. The city is focusing on prevention and pinpointing people and places at highest risk for becoming another victim. It's not just that certain neighborhoods are endemic for gun violence in our city. It's that even certain street segments have a disproportionate number of shooting crimes. So let's talk about Cincinnati's strategy to reduce gun violence with Councilmember Mika Owens and also Jason Cooper, the director of the Collaborative Policing Section. So the city just enacted two new laws to hopefully put an end to gun violence. Councilmember, just give us an overview of what these laws are, what they plan to do. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, these laws are, as I'll explain, really are part of this comprehensive approach that the city is taking to address gun violence. And so the first thing is that we are, we just passed a law to say that if you have kids in the home, mm -hmm. you have to lock up your firearm. And if you have been, uh, convicted of a domestic violence crime, you are also, we are also able to act at this local level um, for, for infractors of, of that. And so, again, this is a part of a comprehensive approach uh, that we're taking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously this is just a start, but how do these laws specifically, like, what are they going to do? What's been the feedback? Because obviously, you know, gun rights is a very divisive issue, but, you know, what's been the feedback as far, uh, so far since these have been passed? Yeah, I think the feedback has been, this is a, a long time coming, and thank goodness we can do something at the local at level because we're so preempted um, from state law. And so while we are people that support the uh, Second Amendment, we also know that there is there are a large percentage of young people and adults who are dying by suicide, uh, homicide. And so if we just can start with safe storage, mm -hmm. um, I think that is definitely a first step approach in terms of how we tackle this issue. Mm -hmm. and, and Jason, you know, obviously this is an issue that's been going on for years. and messaging and getting that message out is so important. We talk about it on the news almost nightly here. How do we get this message to the people who need to hear it? Yeah, one of the things we're exploring is how do we really co-create solutions with communities? So we're having community meetings, we're working with our neighborhood anchors like the Urban League and Women Helping Women to not only prevent violence but intervene in it. So part of the key things that we want to get out is that we have non-law enforcement approaches and those that are led by law enforcement. So we're looking for those who are using crime guns and to get them off the street. And at the same time, we want to reduce gun violence by getting at the root causes of our issues and that and that's really the key of this health through health I'm sorry violence prevention through health equity approach mm -hmm. and you talk about kind of the non-police efforts out there what are those contacts like when you get to 
the youth out there who might need to hear those messages? What are those interactions like? Yeah, to be honest, they're difficult conversations because this is a difficult topic around it. What's causing violence in our community, the trauma that folks are going through once they experience it, the idea of being a victim or a perpetrator or both are really difficult conversations to have. And working to train community advocates to have those conversations, working with folks who have had those experiences has really been a key connection and being effective in the work that we do. Mm -hmm. and, and council member, you know, with the laws that have just been passed, how do you hope to reduce violence through looking at even the health equi equity side of things? Yeah, what we're looking to do is, you know, we do have law enforcement responses, but we know we have to take a multidisciplinary approach to this issue. And so this health equity lens is going to allow us to really co-create together with partners uh, at the table like UC, like Children's Hospital, because again, to Jason's point, we have to get at the root causes of this as well. And so this entire ecosystem of changing um, neighborhoods and being very prescriptive in how we are looking at this issue is going to be so important. And that's why this public health lens is, uh, I believe, going to be effective. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's, it's early and you're bringing in new people all the time. How's it gone so far? Has there been like a specific story where you know maybe one person has been impacted at the very least? Well, this work is, is, is starting. It's unfolding. And so uh, a year ago, we declared uh, a resolution unanimously passed that gun violence being a public health crisis to be able to attempt this approach. And so the administration has been working concertedly uh, behind the scenes to get to the place where we are now looking at all of our violence reduction um, initiatives, but now really focusing on this public health approach um, that's going to help us to just now have a research partner in this because in my mind, we have to build a framework that will hold us accountable to results. And so that means what is it that we want to see? What are we trying to reduce? What are we trying to tackle? And so this approach um, with this research partner is really the work that's been happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And we all hope it's the results that we get on the other side because it's even one story we have to do about a child or anybody who's losing their life or even injured by gun violence is just uh, one too many. So we all hope uh, these strategies work. Councilmember Owens, thank you so much. Jason Cooper, thank you, thank you so much. We, we do appreciate thank it. You. And we appreciate you both coming on here to Let's Talk Simpsy. All right, the impact of gun violence on our children, what you can do to help kids cope with the trauma. Let's Talk Simpsy, we'll be right back. We continue our very important discussion on gun violence now with Dr. Amy Makeley of UC Medical Center and also Kate Schroeder, president and CEO of Interact with Help. Welcome to you both to Let's Talk Cincy. All right, Dr. Makeley, you were uh, in the town hall talking about gun violence. Now, as a physician, you have a very unique viewpoint of all of this chaos that kind of comes in front of you and specifically the mental health aspect of it. Walk us through what you see with these victims, maybe even with the perpetrators um, from your specialty uh, point of view. Uh, absolutely. So at University of Cincinnati Medical Center, we serve the areas, um, the, pretty much the entire tri-state area as the only adult level one trauma center. Mm -hmm. um, so that does mean that we see the vast majority of the victims of gun violence that occur within our city. Um, unfortunately, that is over 400 patients a year. And the ramifications of each and every single incidents of gun violence are just long-standing and horrific. And it's not just the medical problems and the injuries. These patients, the victims, their families, their loved ones, um, the mental health, the emotional health, um, all of those ramifications are all tied into each and every single incidence of gun violence. Um, and so as trauma surgeons, it is really our duty and our obligation to work with uh, the community and the city to try to figure out how to combat this public health crisis. Um, because it's not just the injuries that we see in the hospital. It is years and years of trauma, mentally, physically, and emotionally, that affects these patients and their families. Yeah, it really is so much from the incident that had happened to if they need to go in an ambulance there, however they need the hospital, rehab, and it just goes on and on, and it's really incredible. The process it might take to heal, you know, Kate, you know, with all of this, from your vantage point, interact with, interacting with the uh, health providing services and teens, you know, what, what can the parents do out there? Because there's so much that can be said, but what can be done? Yeah, and I do think as a community, as parents, we need to think like a gardener, is sort of how I think about it. When, you're, when you have a child that is struggling or a teen that's struggling with mental health, or if you had a plant 
you wouldn't blame the plant when there's an issue. You would think about the environment that they are in and how that's influencing the child. And so I do think as a parent, I mean, going back to what Council Member Owen said, think about the safety of the environment that uh, your home is in. If there are sharp objects, I think the also just normalizing talking about mental health is one of the most important things that parents can do. It is really um, getting, there's a lot of free trainings available on one in five or mental health in America to learn how to best communicate with your child. And then I do, you know, your school, every school has a social worker with it to really help them access help and support. As a community, we need to think bigger. We need to wrap the, our arms around these kids and center youth voice mm -hmm. in what, in our solutions. At Interact for Health, we're a health foundation that serves this region. And we know that those closest to the problems are closest to solutions. So it's not bringing, it's not services for youth, it's with them. And Interact for Health just uh, launched a request for proposals earlier this week, um, up to 400,000 for organizations that are really trying to address the youth mental health crisis by centering youth voice in the process. Of course, and uh, Dr. Makeley, you know, uh, from the, the trauma center, what would be something you would want people at home to know about the process inside when things are happening? Because you, you have doctors, you have nurses, and you have the patient, and there's so many things happening. I guess, peel back the curtain, like what's going on in there when all of this is happening, especially when you bring, bring like a 14-year-old in there? So I think that um, there is a huge amount of credit that needs to be made to our pre-hospital providers, our EMS community, and our partners with uh, Cincinnati Police, mm -hmm. um, because if those patients don't get to us, then we don't have a chance um, at helping them. And so we are very fortunate that we live in a city where we have exceptional pre-hospital resources and kudos to those folks to get those patients to us in a very timely fashion. Um, and we do understand that every patient that comes through those doors um, represents someone's loved ones. And our promise to our community is that we will treat every patient that comes through those doors, regardless of gender, race, background, mm -hmm. with the highest level of clinical care that we can. Um, it is a little bit chaotic, like you said at the beginning. Uh, for those of you folks that have been through our emergency room, um, you know that we have a very high volume, uh, very busy center, um, but we are very good at taking care of traumatically injured patients. Uh, we track all of our metrics and everything that we do is geared to making the care of those patients better. And yeah. it is our promise to the community that we will continue to do that. Yeah, we love to hear that. So blessed to have uh, you and your team and everybody over at UC Medical Center taking care of so many different people. All right, being prepared for an emergency, what you need to know following that Ohio toxic train crash. Stay with us here on Let's Talk Cincy. Welcome back to Let's Talk Cincy. The train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, put a renewed focus on emergency preparedness. The incident happened almost five hours northeast of Cincinnati. We'll talk about emergency preparedness in our area coming up here in a moment. But first, Ohio Senators J.D. Vance and Sherrod Brown drafted the Railway Safety Act of 2023. Reporter Kayla Norwood has the details. This bill puts forward new safety requirements and aims to make sure communities are more aware of what's coming through. The White House sees this bill as a good first step. Ohio's governor back in East Palestine Wednesday to tour the site of last month's fiery train derailment. The whole goal here is to, uh, you know, make this community safe. Uh, and it can't happen overnight. You can't get all this stuff out of here overnight. This local disaster highlighting what some see as a need for more federal safety regulations. In Washington, a group of bipartisan senators from Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Missouri introducing a bill to prevent future disasters. We want to make sure there are fewer accidents and when there are, that the damage is much less. The bill includes a number of new safety requirements for trains carrying hazardous materials, like implementing emergency response plans, reducing wheel bearing failures, and operating trains with at least two person crews. There will be more safety inspections, that would have mattered. Um, there will be more notification ahead of time about what hazardous materials on the cars are on the train. It also increases the maximum fine that the Department of Transportation can issue for safety violations from $225,000 to 1% of the railroad's annual operating income, something Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg has been pushing for. This is a moment when I believe we can raise the bar in terms of what we expect and what we require from freight railroads so that fewer communities have to go through what the people of East Palestine are dealing with right now. 
Norfolk Southern says the rail industry needs to learn as much as it can from this incident, and they're committed to doing what it takes to help prevent an incident like this from happening again. In Washington, I'm Kayla Norwood. Joining us now is Cincinnati Assistant Fire Chief Matthew Flagler. Chief Flagler, thanks for uh, coming on. Uh, so, you know, we just saw the legislation being uh, pitched there by our, our Ohio Senators. First thoughts on it? I think at the local level, we're glad to see some more attention paid to sharing information. Mm -hmm. I think that will help our responders when we have access to even more information about the kinds of cargo that's coming through our community. Yeah, yeah of course. And it, you mentioned that. Is it is it tough to get to find out what's coming through our since or through our city, or is it? Do you guys get a heads up like, hey, this train so many cars long might have this on it? At the local level, we're only notified for extremely hazardous shipments okay. of hazardous materials, but hazmat transportation through the city is a daily occurrence. It happens all the time on the roadways, the rail, even the river. Even, even the river as well. So so many ways coming uh, through here. So how in your Position, you know, you work with a lot of people. How are you guys prepared to respond to one of these, you know, mass incidences like these? We take the uh, responsibility of taking care of the community very seriously, and we feel we have a deep bench. Uh, we, out of our 900 staff, 130 of our members are trained at the hazardous materials technician level. Those are the people that would respond to and coordinate a response to a hazardous materials emergency. Um, and we maintain an on-duty staff of more than a dozen technicians all the time, and we have two hazardous materials companies and other support units that respond with them to any type of emergency. Okay, and we're kind of showing some video of that training. Can you walk us through some of these pictures? I've seen a lot of people in full hazmat gear, a, a, you know, a lot of other stuff. It kind of takes to what are we seeing here? On yeah, the this is a response to a two different train derailments that have happened over the past several years, but just an example of the way our hazardous materials unit would respond. These are our firefighters that are on duty all the time and they have additional training and responsibility for hazardous materials. So uh, the first obligation is to g gather information. We wanna make sure we know what the problem is. So you see the crews there, they were taking some air samples and identifying the products. That helps us understand if we need to make an evacuation or have people shelter in place, which just means stay inside their home and let the hazard pass them by. Um, so we would spend some time doing that and then as the need arises we can mitigate that hazard, we can stop a leak, we can um, take care of emergencies at a more technical level. Mm -hmm. And you know, one thing I want to touch on, like you guys are invested in the community so when something happens in your own backyard it's not only all hands on deck but you guys are, are protecting your own homes at the same time. Correct. This is our friends and neighbors and our own families that we're taking care of and it certainly helps that we have an understanding of the geography. Um, we know the rail lines and where they would intersect with waterways and uh, key populations that might need extra assistance, so we're extra aware of that. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some things listed on the CFD website about people uh, creating personal preparedness plans that can be used in all different sorts of manners. I don't know if we have those uh, points coming up, but kind of walk us through, you know, this is stuff that people can do at home as far as uh, being ready just in case. Yeah, we always want people to be aware that, uh, you know, bad things can happen and we want them to be as prepared as possible. So um, having some supplies and equipment to protect yourself, but mostly it is just being able to receive information about an emergency and being able to have a family communications plan so that you know you can reach other members of your family and ensure everyone's safe. No, absolutely. You see responsible party for carrying out specific actions, personal equipment, medications, important documents, important contact information, um, also important. Now when you saw uh, what happened out in East Palestine, did you think like this is one of those things where it, it could happen anywhere and the response needs to go now or did you send anybody out that direction? It's a, it's a devastating incident mm -hmm. and it's very serious. Uh, fortunately, it's also exceedingly rare. And so we're aware of that. We know that it could happen in our community anytime we always prepare. We did not send any staff there, but we obviously participated in some of the preparedness at the local level and we offered support uh, northward as needed. And then like the Cincinnati Water Works, for example, was mm -hmm. really instrumental in making sure the community here was safe by testing the water and um, being aware of what was happening upstream. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there'll be some learning experiences from there that will be passed on to you guys here. Yes, we're already been working with the management team and receiving some of their preliminary after actions to make sure that we're in line with the reality that those folks were facing on the field up there. All right, Chief, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Lots thank of you. great tips there. When Let's Talk Cincy returns, the origin of a Cincinnati tradition, how the Flying Pig Marathon started in a bar.
Welcome back. Lacing up your running shoes for the Flying Pig Marathon is a staple here in Greater Cincinnati. The race started with an idea at a local bar in 1998. Well, great idea doesn't come from a bar. WLWT News 5 anchor Kelly Rippin sits down with the man who helped create the course that started on a napkin. The combination of running and beer and, you know, energy, um, somebody said along the way there'd never be a marathon in Cincinnati. And I guess I'm just the kind of person that that's that's what I needed to hear. And so I said, has anybody ever put together a, a business plan? And just like that, the squeals were in motion. After a long run with a Bob Ronkers running group, it wasn't uncommon for runners to meet for post run drinks at O'Brien's. There, the very first draft of the Flying Pig was created. The story of the, the napkin is really about the route. It's about where could you actually do it? On a napkin, Coughlin and friends sketched out a way to run 26.2 miles around Cincinnati with the goal of highlighting all of our neighborhoods and what they had to offer. And we, when we designed the course, we tried to make sure that we, we went through as many communities as we could, including Northern Kentucky, which we did. And I think that's part of the flavor of the race is that it's not just going back and forth on a highway. It's, it, it really is part of the community. From a napkin to execution, it was a lot of strategic planning, placement, and grunt work to pull it all together. A lot to take on for a man with a young family, young business, and a lot of people saying it couldn't be done. But Coughlin had a motivated group of friends and volunteers. A handful flew out to a race director's conference with freshly printed business cards that read the Cincinnati Marathon, which at the time didn't exist. I, I'm pretty amazed at you know, where it is at this point. Um, from the standpoint of how it's grown even beyond a marathon. It's really a big community event now, but I never start anything without thinking that it can be successful. I'm an optimist. That positivity and persistence paid off. The Cincinnati Marathon became the flying pig. And now, even when he's on vacation thousands of miles from Cincinnati, Coughlin is followed by that little pig that was almost an afterthought, but became the focal point of Cincinnati's race weekend. And I started talking to the guys from Cincinnati. He said to me, have you ever heard of the Flying Pig Marathon? I started laughing and he showed me a picture that the day before a woman with a flying pig running shirt had been in to this little restaurant bar that had some pigs next to it. The Flying Pig has grown from the marathon to a weekend of events for people and pets and of all abilities. It also extends beyond the first weekend in May with Pig Works running multiple races in the city throughout the year. Many on the Pig Works Flying Pig team have been there since the beginning and they are excited to see the new ways it can continue to grow. Kelly Rippin, WLWT News 5. Well, so much to look forward to with the next Flying Pig Marathon. 25 years, can you believe it? From a napkin now to a course and people cannot wait to sign up each and every single year. All right, thanks for joining us. We will see you next week for another edition of Let's Talk Sensi.